and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. The Gospel passage, which we just heard, the first thing that comes to our attention is the negligence of the public health officer because no leper should be within the city confines. Lepers, in their existence, lived a life of isolation, perceived as contaminated and disconnected from everybody and everything. The leper was the great environmental hazard much like the great environmental hazard of the universe, sin. Jesus reached out in response to his appeal and touched him. But instead of Jesus becoming unclean as the law would provide, the leper himself was cleansed and healed. Jesus then sends the leper to the priest. And if we read in the 14th chapter of Leviticus, the quite detailed rubric of how he is to be examined by the priest and certified in the sacrifice which is to be offered, the passage which we shall now not read, we would find the simple instructions to take two birds, to offer one in sacrifice, and the second having been sprinkled with the blood of the first, to be freed. And while some people can see the two birds as offering the example of death and of life, I'm inclined to think there in fact may be a little parallel with the rites of Yom Kippur when one goat is sacrificed the second goat has that blood sprinkled on him and is driven into the wilderness as a bearer of the sins of the people we are reminded of the defilement which the leprosy represents that defilement which separates him not only from others, but from the public worship of God, a kind of personal impurity. And we are reminded that the Old Testament rites do not heal and do not purify. They certify that God has healed him. And they restore him to the people. But in terms of the leper, they are ineffectual. But the New Testament priest, Jesus, does restore, and does heal, and does cleanse, and does impart holiness. In that great treatise in the letter to the Hebrews, We learn that Jesus entered once and for all into the holy place, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more would the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Jesus, we heard at the very be at the beginning of the reading of this first letter of John last week in the daily office, we're reminded it is the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from our sins. That this living Jesus has now been glorified on high and he has passed into the Holy of Holies. 
where he ever liveth to make intercession for us. Jesus, who himself has now become the new mercy seat, who by his perfect offering enables us to be washed clean of all our sins. I remember the first time that I visited the shrine at Walsingham. And after one of the services, we were walking around and there was this very small alcove, which was marked as the Chapel of the Ascension. And I looked up and on the plaster ceiling, I was astonished to see protruding two feet. And I looked at it and I said to myself, this is tacky. <laughs> but I looked again and I saw that the two feet were pierced. And I began to realize that in this representation, we have here the complete whole humanity of Jesus with his pierced feet represented as ascending to glory and taking our humanity now redeemed into the very heart of the Trinity. Jesus becomes the bridge over troubled waters. He becomes in reality that link between God and man. He is the mercy seat. He is the propitiation for our sins. And then St. Luke almost interrupts his narrative to tell us that Jesus recurrently leaves to go into desert places. He goes to seek that deep communion with the Father because this is the pivotal relationship in Jesus' life. Jesus reminds us in John's Gospel that apart from him, we can do nothing. And Jesus models the truth of this by this persistent and deep communion with his Father. The danger that we can fall into, both as clergy and as ordinary church members, is that we are content with public worship, that we are satisfied by mechanical prayer. But in fact, if we have lives devoid of private and personal prayer, we are on the verge of becoming bankrupt. Going alone to be with the Lord is the basis of our spiritual lives and our lives as a Christian community. Henry Nouwen reminds us in one of his books that solitude is the basis of community. Puritan Thomas Goodwin died around, I think, 1680, puts on the lips of the Lord, you always come to me when you have some business, but when will you come to see me? And so often this is true. We treat God like he is a heavenly valet with our lists of needs and wants and desires. And in fact, he wants us to come simply to see him and be with him. George MacDonald once said that the most dangerous thing was the handling of holy things. And I submit for us, this is an occupational hazard. Private prayer, contemplation, soaking prayer, receptive prayer, all these are that times for God to come, to touch us, to direct us, to renew us, to refresh, refresh us. Whether we do it scripturally in Lexio Divina, or Eucharistic adoration, or stillness and listening, it is essential. Because friendship is fostered by frequency. And solitude with God then builds us and primes us.
for communion with others. Spurgeon once wrote that neglect of private prayer is the locus which devours the strength of the church. And then Jesus is interrupted. The paralytic arrives. Jesus is teaching. He comes down to the roof. We know the scenario. And Jesus proceeds to heal him both spiritually and physically. And he is restored in the needed sequence. Over at the periphery, the rabbinical experts are jockeying. What is he doing? Who does he think he is? But the healing confirms Jesus' authority to forgive with the assurance of forgiveness. The man is restored, not unlike the leper. All of this becomes the harbinger of what is coming in the kingdom. My buddy Spurgeon says again, unforgiven sin is the root of spiritual paralysis. And fast forwarding to the 20th century, Carl Menninger wrote, so long as a person lives under the shadow of real, unacknowledged, and unexpiated guilt, he will continue to hate himself and to suffer the inevitable consequences of self-hatred. But the minute he begins to accept his guilt and his sinfulness, the possibility of radical reformation opens up in a new freedom of self-respect and peace. This is where the message and the proclamation of the gospel can change an individual life. I remember one time giving a leading a renewal weekend a couple hundred miles from where I lived. And a woman coming up to me and saying, Father, can a Baptist go to confession? And I said, I guess so. And so during one of the breaks, she came to talk to me and she said, 46 years ago, I had an abortion. And I have carried this with me. I have gone from one pastor to another. I have gone to counselors and I have gone to therapists. And it is still driving me crazy. She was young, she was a teenager. They assured her that she had made the best choice of the choices that were available. They told her not to feel bad, that she was okay. But after she'd listened to the talks on the renewal weekend, it bothered her even more. And so up by the altar, she made her confession, and I absolved her, and she left a different person. She didn't need to hear that she was okay. She needed to hear that she had been forgiven. And she got a new life. The last question we have in the Catechism and the Prayer Book is what is our assurance? Everybody looks for assurance. The assurance is that nobody and no thing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. We are invited to enjoy transformed lives. Jesus offered whole healing for the whole man. He commissioned the paralytic to go home. And St. Luke tells us he did go home, glorifying God. We need to preach this afresh in every generation. We need to preach both for conversion and for sanctification, a life begun and continued in Christ Jesus unto the end. I had a friend of mine who grew up in the UK, ardent evangelical, reform, and came into the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And he said, I was surrounded simply by people who were evangelicals, many of whom had then 
had the experience of Pentecost in their lives. And he said it was wonderful. And he said, and then I came to America. And I found others who were filled with the Holy Spirit whose lives had gotten a new start. And he said that I was scandalized to discover they were almost entirely Anglo-Catholics. He said what my experience evidence was that God was using a variety of renewal initiatives begun by God, not by man, to strengthen and revitalize his church, to bring the riches and the truth out of every dimension of our Christian life. The church which is truly Catholic, truly evangelical, truly spirit-filled, that can serve Christ the fullness of his plan and extend his kingdom of justice and love and peace. You, my sisters and brothers, are privileged to be present as God is renewing his church, to give us a deep and abiding love for his word, an assurance that he speaks to us and acts in our lives in the sacraments of grace, that he gives us hope and a new future, and he does this all for his tender mercy's sake. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost.